are 35 million girls in the United States below the age of 15, and another 10 million between the ages of 15 and 19. And all of them have families. So think about how many people that is. And I had occasion to meet the five women in the photograph on Fifth Avenue on a beautiful summer day last year. And it was a catalytic moment for me that brought me to this stage tonight. I learned so much from them. And I'm going to tell you more about them in a minute. But what I, what I want to get us focused on is what this talk is about. And the question that I posed when I was putting it together was, were you born worthy? And the easy answer is that, of course, we're all born worthy. Every child that's born in the world is born worthy. But I think the bigger question and the challenging question, particularly for girls and women, is when did you know it? And can you hold on to that feeling? Or do you sink into doubt and question your value because there's so much around you that is questioning your value? So what I'm going to share with you now is, is, is some of the work that I've done over the decades to advance the cause of women and girls. And, and, and the first one, this is, this is the very first poster from the, from the first Take Our Daughters to Work Day. And it is a day that I certainly was very clear that I felt born worthy, and I think so did the 25 million girls and parents and employers who participated. It was an extraordinary experience. And my own experience of it, I, I, I woke up early, and I had at that point in my life done a lot of big events. You know, but you had to go somewhere. You know, you, I, I, I put a million people in Central Park for Earth Day and, and, and stuff like that. But this was not some, there wasn't any place to go. There wasn't a big gathering place because everyone had been invited to take their daughters to work. And at best, we thought maybe, I don't know, a half a million, maybe a million people would do it. So I wake up and I turn on the television trying to figure out where I should go, what I should do. It is 6 AM, and the first thing I see is a weatherman on one of the early shows with his daughter sitting next to him, doing the weather. Yeah. And I started flipping channels. And on every station, there were girls on television. And I remember, I, I, I literally just threw myself back in bed, pulled the covers over my head, and called one of the women that I had been working with. And she was headed to Grand Central. And she was describing to me as she got off the train how many girls she saw with their parents going to work. So, so, we, so we knew we had, had, had a, a success on our hands. And, and it, it grew and grew over the years. And Take Our Daughters to Work started because Gloria Steinem and her organization, the Ms. Foundation, after 20 years of existence, was looking at research that said that even after all the advances that had been made, girls' self-esteem still dropped when they hit adolescence in dramatic, dramatic proportions. And at that time, back in the 1990s, there was a much higher rate of teen pregnancy, high rate of, 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 of teen suicide. There were other things going on that made people very concerned about what was happening to girls. And it was really about helping girls see what their future could be. Because when I was in school, and I'm sure there are other people in the audience who remember this, but all girls could be then, I remember vocation day at Blessed Sacrament School, where you had to draw three pictures of what you might be and to a girl, you were either going to be a teacher, a nun, or a mommy. There was really not much else that you had seen. The only other women I'd seen in magazines were like Queen Elizabeth and, you know, maybe Mamie Eisenhower. So there weren't a lot of examples. And what Take Our Daughters to Work Day brought forward, and it so hit me tonight watching the women on the stage. We've got rocket scientists, rock climbers, just actresses, singers, dancers. Women can now do and be in any job. And what happened during Take Our Daughters to Work Day was that 
Not only did the girls appreciate that, but so did their parents, so did their teachers, and so did employers across the country. They saw girls in a way that they'd never seen them before. And one of my favorite Take Our Daughters to Work Day stories, it's the very first day there was a reporter sitting in a, in a typical Brooklyn coffee shop near a subway station. And it's one of these places where people come in fast, get their coffee, their bagel, you know, and, and, and go. But there were seats, there, there's stools in this, in this uh, place. And a little girl comes in with her dad. And he works at, I think it was called Brooklyn Union Gas then. And he's taking her to work. There were no other women in the place, no other females in the place except the waitress behind the counter. And the little girl is all dressed up. She climbs up on the stool. She's sitting there. She's spinning around, all the things that a seven-year-old would do. And uh, she orders a hot chocolate and a buttered roll, a very, very good, you know, Brooklyn breakfast. And the waitress finally looks at her and says, honey, what are you doing? You know, where are you going? You know, what, what's happening today? And her father pushed a leaflet across to the waitress that described that, you know, this take our daughters to work day thing. And so the waitress reads it and she looks at her and she says, honey, this sounds like it's going to be really, you know, fun. And she said, what do you think the day's about? And this little girl looks at her and she looks at her dad and she's looking around and she finally looks at the waitress and she said, well, it's a day when all of us girls are going to get our steam back. <laughs> so, so, uh, I could do just a whole talk on Take Our Daughters to Work Day stories, but, but, but so, so, so it's a day where we get our steam back. And I, I built a career out of, of helping women and girls not only get their steam back, but build up their steam. This next, next slide is a picture of me with an extraordinary group of women at the New York Stock Exchange, ringing the Stock Exchange bell in 2011. It was the first time in the 226-year history of the stock exchange that an all-female group had ever rung the bell. Woo! And that, I, I will never forget it, because the stock exchange building is, 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 is a historic, just beautiful building, but it has become sort of symbolic, and it was surrounded with very tight security because of what happened during 9-11. So it's, it's, it's a tough place to get into. You've got multiple security checks. And I'm going, and I'm thinking, you know, I, I don't know what to, I did not know what to expect. Because I have worked with, 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 with small business owners, not, not, not really, you know, never been to the stock exchange. And we go through all the security, this gorgeous old building, and you walk in, and it's like you're on a spaceship. They have all these beautiful blue walls that are like something out of, I, I don't, I, I've never seen anything like it. But on it was all this information about Count Me In and Make Mine a Million, our organization. There were pictures, there were all kinds of things floating along this blue screen. So we are just all sort of blown away thinking, wow, it's, it's kind of like, you know, when you go to a big uh, game and they have a jumbotron, and, you know, your picture ends up there, you know, when you're supposed to be kissing somebody or at somebody's anniversary. It was like that but at the stock exchange. And we go in, and we go back to the you know, 18th century. I think this building was built in the Civil War. We go back, and there is this incredible coffee and tea laid out on, in this beautiful dining room. And we meet all the leaders of the stock exchange. Because apparently, this is the tradition. This is the ritual every day at the stock exchange when they start their business. And these women as we gathered and started to understand both the tradition of this, but the magnitude, because we didn't know we were the first all-female group. We had no idea until some of the women who worked there told us that. And for the first time, some of these women who had grown their businesses to multi-million dollar businesses, which is highly unusual for any woman to grow their business to multi-million dollars, and this was a group of them, they started to think about growing their business to the point where they could be traded on the exchange. So these are moments that I describe to give you an idea of the kind of, of, of bridges I have, have built with, with women and men to help women see where they can go and how they can get there. So you'll appreciate my dismay and my alarm when I started to see new research coming out about two years ago about what was happening to girls again. 25 years since Take Your Daughters to Work Day, 
I'm starting to read things like this. 70% of girls between the ages of 13 and 18 feel they are not good enough. That's 30 million girls. Think about that as parents, as potential employers of them. But if you're not feeling good enough, how, how are you going to, 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 to move forward, to create a life, to, 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 to be some of the women we saw on the stage tonight? And part of what I started to think about was one of the major changes that has happened since Take Our Daughters to Work Day is, is, is the invention of the smartphone and social media. And the more research I did, the more alarmed I got. Girls and women, and I'm sure some men, look at 700 million makeup videos a month. 700 million, that's about 84 billion a year. So that the information in the images that are flooding our daughters, nieces, granddaughters' eyes are all about, you know, and I, I, I'm, I like makeup as much as the next girl. But that many images, and if they're not looking at makeup, they're looking at celebrities. And the other thing that is going on, while, while we're looking at all those makeup videos, men, boys, women, and girls are looking at 90 billion pornography videos a year. So there, there's, there's some fundamental changes taking place in terms of what's in our vision and who's looking at what and how we understand each other or don't understand each other. So the fact that they don't feel good enough started to make some sense to me. One in four girls will be sexually assaulted before they turn the age of 18. That has not changed from 25 years ago. That consistently is the number. But I think it is, it is with all the things that have been going on with Me Too and different things, it, 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 it raises a set of, of questions about, I think we, we work so hard to protect our girls to protect our daughters. And I think what we know now is protection, while it is, it is, is a, a great instinct, I think there is more that we need to do about preparing them and sharing our stories with them about how we have handled situations like this. And the final stat that just you know, sent me over the edge was that 80% of girls between 11 and 21 feel that their looks are the most important thing about them. I had hoped we'd move further along than that. I remember during the early days of Take Our Daughters to Work Day, I had to remind myself every time I went to talk to a group of girls to not get overwhelmed by their cuteness. It's hard. We are cute, we are beautiful, we are all of those things. But that is not the only thing that we are. And so I'm at an event in February of this year. And I'm listening to a leader of a girls' organization describing a meeting that went on at an REI store with a group of girls who are obviously physically active and into sports and whatever. And the leader of the group, it's about 100 girls, asks them, what are the three words that you think describe what is expected of you in the world? And they ask them to text the answers, because you know with kids, if you know, one person says something and everybody says the same thing. The three top words, the three top words were pretty, polite, and perfect. In 2018, with all the changes that have taken place, this is what a lot of girls still believe is what's expected of them. And I think about those words. Of all the words to describe female beauty, pretty is a pretty, it's a small word. Pretty is, you know, getting by, being just okay. And polite. Well, we all want our daughters and sons to be polite. 
that it is the first thing or the second thing that they think of. And it's also small. It's all about shrinking. It's not, you're not taking up space if you're pretty, polite, and perfect. You're being sort of seen and not heard. And perfect is just impossible. I don't know a woman or a man who has said they have gotten where they've gotten because they're perfect. But this is what too many of our daughters and granddaughters think. And I had occasion to read an article in the New York Times a couple of months ago. It was a very short story. And it was about a girl who had a twin brother. And she was complaining. It was an advice column. She was complaining that every morning when she walks down the stairs, her father has something to say about what she has on and what she looks like. And that he never says anything about what her brother has on or what he looks like. And it led her to believe that what he thought was important about her was what she looked like and what she wore. And you know, as I was talking about this, a friend of mine said, you know, because apparently the father was often very complimentary. It wasn't that he was criticizing her, but that all he could see was her appearance. And the columnist advised her to talk to him about it and to tell him how it made her feel. So I think we all need to think about what we talk to girls about and what we share with girls because there's so much coming at them. There's so much commercial energy coming at them, telling them to change how they look, telling them their looks are the most, the only thing. So now we're back on Fifth Avenue. And I'm, I, I meet this extraordinary group of girls who are on the street. They're young women. They're, 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 they're high school who are in a college program for the summer. It's a women in technology program at City University in New York. And they're on the street, and they're interviewing people because they're learning how to do podcasts. They're also learning how to talk to strangers. And they, they come up to me, and I just, you know, dissolve in sort of giggles because of my whole life and that they want to interview me. And we have a very fascinating, wonderful conversation. Many of them had participated in Take Our Daughters to Work Day. Two of them wanted to start their own business. And it was one of the, there were, there were no selfies being taken. The teacher finally came along and said, you know, that we should take a picture. But it was a conversation about what they wanted to do and who they wanted to be. And there was nothing about what they looked like. And so it really led me to start thinking about, well, how do we, how do we shift this? How do we shift this intense focus on, on, on looks and, and, and pretty, polite, and perfect? And what is, in fact, What are the three words, what are the things that we need to communicate with girls about in terms of what they need to move forward? And those words are really courage, capability, and, 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 and creativity. Because what I know about those girls is they are going to need courage to be in the businesses that they want to go into. They want to go into the tech sector. And what is still happening in the tech sector is young women go into that sector because what we have proved, if there was ever a question, with all the STEM programs and all that stuff, girls can do all the math, they can do the engineering, they can do the work. But they get into those jobs and 41% of them leave in less than two years because they cannot see a full life in it and the culture is so hostile to them. And the courage that they are going to need and that we need to help them develop is how are they going to go in and change environments and make them a place where they will thrive as opposed to getting into those things and just thinking, this is not for me, I feel too uncomfortable, I got to go. We are losing too much talent, too much creativity. I, it is, so I thought about all the things I've already done and what I think has happened is that we farm too much of girls coming of age, the sort of commercial entities. 
they learn about beauty from these videos, not necessarily from their mothers or their grandmothers or their aunties. Because there's something in, you know, going seven generations back and seven generations forward in terms of understanding who we are and where we're headed. And I, I, I think it is really time for a new movement that is a, a 21st century rite of passage for girls to young womanhood. Because when do we hold girls up and say that they are valuable, that they are worthy, and embrace their worthiness and help them do it so that they can go on and be courageous? and develop capabilities, and to unleash their creativity in a world that desperately needs it. So we, we are, 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 we've, we've already started the work, and um, I would just urge all of you to think about what would happen to have girls using their worthiness to change the world. And what I invite you all to do is obviously join us at bornworthy.org. I am looking for communities that want to host a Born Worthy weekend. Uh, starting on March 1st, we're going to create our first uh, Born Worthy event. So I would really urge all of you to think about your daughters, your sons, and, and join us in Born Worthy. Thank you very much. Thank you.